So hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of The Good and the Bad of Black Grad. My name is Ian Worley, and I'm the executive director of CAGS, the Canadian Association for Graduate Studies. We are delighted that you have joined us today. And be before we begin this session, I would like to make a few housekeeping announcements. First, this webinar includes a simultaneous remote transcription service, which you can access through the link provided in the chat menu. A new window will be opened on your internet browser and translated text should begin streaming automatically. Secondly, if you have any questions or comments for the speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A tool. If you would like to pose a question verbally, please let us know and we can offer you the virtual mic. If you would like to converse with other attendees throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat menu. There are a series of three polls featured in this webinar, and when the time comes to answer a poll question, a window will open on your screen and you'll be able to answer the poll. Uh, next, we highly recommend that you select speaker view on your Zoom screen by clicking on the top right hand side of your Zoom window. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the CAG's YouTube page and on the GBBG social media accounts in the near future. It is also essential that we recognize and acknowledge that this symposia is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. CAGS and those gathered here today honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. I would now like to turn things over to the series producer and host, Dr. Evelyn Asidu. Originally from Brampton, Ontario, Dr. Asidu received her Bachelor of Science degree from Western University in 2013 and her PhD from the University of Alberta in 2021. She is currently completing a postdoctoral fellowship with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Her volunteer activities have centered around environmental sustainability, community, community building, and the promotion of diversity in science. I now pass the virtual mic over to you, Evelyn. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? That's a thumbs up. Great. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Welcome to, as Ian said, episode two of the good and the bad of Black Grad. So um, we are here today to continue the conversation and first and foremost to raise Black voices, Black researchers, Black academics who are here from across Canada. Um, the goal of this webinar series is to um, challenge ourselves and to to, as I mentioned before, keep the conversation going. And I hope that through this discussion, we'll be able to inspire current and prospective Black graduate students, as well as hopefully give a different perspective to administrators and allies who may not otherwise be uh, have an opportunity to hear these type of uh, candid discussions. So I welcome everybody who's here. Also um, have to quickly say that the conversations that we're having here are very true and authentic and the opinions voiced by the panelists are those of their own. Um, and because we're being our authentic selves and because we're being so honest, um, we ask that you know you do the same. Uh, at the same time, um, we'll be ask, answering questions um, and we understand that some of these questions might have complicated answers, um, but that's the whole point. That's part of why we're here. Um, but in that same vein, we will not address or um, tolerate any harmful comments or questions and hate speech is just a, a no no just not 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 going to be tolerated here and anybody who has such opinions or beliefs will be removed from the room. So um, before we get into our discussion, I would like to say a uh, thank you, huge thank you to Simon Fraser University. This episode is brought to you by SFU's graduate and postdoctoral studies program um, through, the, through the supervision of the 21st Century Project, which is led by Leah Bibani, Jeff Durskin, and Roxanne Panchansi. So thank you guys so much for supporting the series. All right, so episode two, Recruit, Retain, Represent. I'm very excited to introduce our uh, panelists here today from all across the country. I'm um, starting with Olivia Gosh, who is a PhD student at Western University. Uh, quickly, how would you describe in a couple words the best part of grad school? <laughs> um, in a couple words, okay, that's a tough one because there's that's so okay. many layers to grad school, <laughs> but definitely um, I enjoy the flexibility and the leadership that, that I'm always challenged with on a daily basis. Love it. Let's keep it rolling. Peter, you're next. Peter is a PhD candidate from the University of Ottawa, and he's calling from Ottawa, Ontario for today. And so what would, how would you respond to that? The best part about grad school is? I was, I was going to say the exact same as Olivia. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. So come up with your all... own answer. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I think I would say um, the opportunity, uh, the opportunity to to do things outside the box and, uh, and explore different uh, different options. Awesome. 
Thank you, Peter. And lastly, uh, we have Alexandra Davis, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta, from, reporting from Edmonton, Alberta. And so what would you say, Alex, is the best part of grad school? Um, I'm going to be really cheesy and say um, the lifelong friendships. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. I love that. I love that. Awesome. Yeah. So we have these lovely panelists, as I mentioned, from all across Canada. Thank you guys again for being here with me. And their profiles can be found on the KEGS website, as well as um, we'll share their social media information if you want to follow each of them and, and all the fun things that they're doing. So um, to kick off, um, I'm going to then, I guess, get them to expand about the things that they do. We'll start off this time other direction. Alex, can you give us an elevator pitch about your research? Yeah, so my current research um, as a postdoc is looking at conservation and management tools for invasive species. So I um, focus in two completely different areas. So um, I have some research that's still focused on the invasive Indo-Pacific lionfish in the Caribbean and Florida and looking at how to most efficiently remove those given limited resources. And then I'm also currently working through a Libra Arrow postdoctoral fellowship um, on invasive European green crab in the Salish Sea. And um, there specifically, I'm looking at what different stakeholders value and using those types of things to integrate into a management plan because um, varied values are often sometimes left out when you're thinking of kind of the cut and dry of why you want to remove an invasive species. Mm, very interesting work. Thank you, Alex. How about you, Peter? What are, what are the things that you do in your PhD? Uh, so mainly I study uh, the impacts of climate change and uh, habitat loss or other land use changes. I look how these are, uh, how historic changes in the last hundred years have affected communities of wildlife across the globe, especially pollinators like bumblebees and butterflies. Um, and I also do a lot of work with community science. So I look at how we can use that for research, uh, what sort of information that it adds and, uh, and how it shapes our understanding of where species are and how we can uh, save them from extinction. Very cool. Thanks for sharing with us. And lastly, we have Olivia, who I think her science is a little bit different than the other two. Yeah. So I'm uh, more in the sphere of neuroscience. That's exactly the sphere I'm in. Um, and I look at ways that we can change uh, lifestyle and various treatment regimens to better um, boost this, uh, the concept of neuroplasticity. So our ability to rewire and rechange how our brain, um, brain cells interact so that we can better improve memory. So I look at, for example, in those who are obese, ways that we can help um, improve memory, especially because we see a lot of cognitive impairments in this patient population and using cool tools like exercise, or even if exercise is impossible, because that's all honestly a privilege to have is the ability to exercise other tools like supplement supplements, um, dietary supplements, or um, even medications that are fairly common. Uh, for example, metformin, which is an anti-diabetic medication mm -hmm. to see if we can boost these cognitive processes to help us um, better function on a daily basis. Yeah, right. And you had said something when we when we chatted earlier about how sugar has an impact on memory, which made me so yeah. sad. Yeah, I know. So sad. <laughs> it's because the, the model I use, so you can't necessarily find an obese mouse. So I look at I look at mice. You can't find them um, just hanging around. So I use very uh, real life example, which is the way we eat, and I make I give them high fat, high sugary foods to see how that impacts their their brain functions. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So as you can see, we have very cool researchers here, very cool scientists here. Um, uh, one one uh, oversight I made is that I did target all scientists. And uh, so this is a, a little bit of a change up from the last episode, but I'm sure that this is, it, it'll still be an, an awesome um, and nerdy conversation, which we're all here for. Um, with that being said, I was actually hoping that uh, Ian could launch a poll question one. So you guys know about us now, and we want to know who's here in the audience. So poll question one is just asking, who are you? And uh, just so it can give us a little bit of an idea about how to tailor um, perhaps our answers. Um, so I don't know. It, it's popped up on my screen. I don't know if I'm supposed to answer as well. So I'm just going to. Oh, I can't. OK, that's fine. <laughs> it says I cannot vote. Just do a bit of reading. OK, it's fine. So, yeah, we'll just give you guys a few seconds here to to let us know who you are um, before we talk a little bit more about how how we all got here at this point and what brought us to research will be 
the next uh, set of questions. We're at 93% uh, voted. Evelyn, do you want me to end the poll? Yeah, let's close her down. 95%, great. 97%, wow. Wow, Almost okay. <laughs> and do I get to see the results now? Oh, maybe. Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. Oh, we have a very mixed audience here. All right. So general attendees, undergrads, grads, faculty, postdocs, admins, we have like everybody here. So just, it's good to know that we have a, a very mixed group of people. And I mean, that just lets us know that lots of people are interested in, in what we have to say and what's happening here. So thank you guys all for, for being here, both panelists and attendees. So uh, the next question that I have for our panelists is just trying to get us thinking more about, you know, why why we do research. I mean, um, when I first launched the series, there was a lot of angst inside of me, which happens when you do a PhD. But obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of good things that happen. And so I'm going to start uh, with Olivia and just ask you about, um, do you know, the moment that inspired you to do to do research? Do you, can you remember? And if it wasn't a specific moment, maybe it was a person. So, yeah, this is a great question because I don't, I don't think I really saw um, a career in research as a career. I just always associated that with academia and being a student. Mm -hmm. So I think as I went through, and I didn't, I, and I, even as a young kid, I didn't understand the concept of what a scientist was. And that includes this concept of researching on a daily basis. And it's not always at the level of being um, working in a lab that isn't associated with anything. It's associated mm -hmm. with some kind of institution. And I didn't understand that fully. Um, and I think as I moved through my undergraduate career, um, kind of in my own little silo, just trying to see where I best fit, um, it wasn't until I actually had my first step into research in my summer. I researched as many summers as I could to get my foot in the door and understand what I, what I wanted to do. And if that was in either health, either as a physician, and that's usually always the first route to go when you think mm -hmm. of science, or then moving out of that and actually finding um, something that is of personal interest for myself. And I think it wasn't until heading into my third year summer where I was like, research is what I happen to be really good at. And I love the outcome of it. So either mm -hmm. the publishing process or sharing and disseminating the science or talking about the science or being able to use my um, position at, in research as a platform to kind of instill change. So that was it. Wow. It took time, but, and somehow you naturally get stuck into the graduate life and I, and I, in a good way, stuck in a good way where I'm actually, um, realizing that this is a space where I'm thriving currently. So why change that? I love that. I love that. I also am, um, jealous and maybe a little appalled that you like the publishing process because that is not typically one of the it's, areas that we <laughs> not the process it's the outcome of it it's okay like, the ah, outcome yeah finally right. it's, it's out there <laughs> now I'm sharing but not not the actual process man yeah, we're, we're can be like totally opposite people and I'm like what is Girl. that <laughs> right of course yeah so that's that's great thank you thanks Olivia um Peter do you do you have a particular moment in your head perhaps that made you think that this is this is what I want to do yeah I, I actually had like a, a very defined moment of oh, when I knew what I wanted to do I guess when I was growing up like in high school and stuff I I really enjoyed uh, being outside my family would go camping all the time um, and I was really good at science um, and so I wanted to do something in science I didn't know exactly what but um, like Olivia said like I think you know physician medical doctor is like the first thing you think of when you're like good at science um, and you don't know like exactly what you want to do that's like the the goal and that was like that's the, the only <laughs> yeah that was like the only job science job that I really knew about um, so when I started university I was in a biomedical sciences degree um, and uh, and that was the that was the goal um, and I, I did pretty well I made a lot of like friends and, and whatnot and then in the second year I remember I took an ecology course I was like I like, I like nature. Let's learn a little bit about this. And it was like, from the very first class, it was like a mind blowing. I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Like anatomy is fun, but this is like another level. Um, and so I ended up like at the end of that year, switching into biology and uh, I went into, uh, worked in a lab for an honors project, uh, actually in the lab that I'm in right now. And it was like the big picture science, being able to make, do research that, that makes a positive change or that can inform you know, positive impacts was, uh, was just super exciting. And so I stayed into that and, uh, and that, but that was the moment that first ecology course was like the mind blowing 
this is this is where I want to be. Uh, this awesome. is where I want to make my difference. Yeah. So cool. So cool. And now you do butterflies and birds and bees and all this. Yeah. Love it. It's very, very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. Very much nature within nature. <laughs> and yeah. uh, Alex, any any particular standout moments for you? I would say, um, I don't know if it's a standout moment, but maybe a standout class that sure. I did. Yeah. So um, when I was doing my undergrad degree from marine science, I was actually in a research lab. I worked for a, a seafloor mapping group, which I loved, but I don't know if I necessarily thought of it as a career. Um, but as part of my courses, we, we um, were one of the first schools out there to have a scientific diving course. And I thought, great, I love the water. I've been a swimmer and a water polo player my entire life. So it's like, yes, diving, that sounds good. And um, doing the diving course, like learning how to count fish, doing transects, I was like, I can get paid to do this or I can go to school to do this. <laughs> that was kind of the moment for me. Like, I love being in the water, on the water. I've considered a lot of other water focused careers and like knowing that I could use all the skills that I learned doing my marine biology and ecology courses and be in the water and count fish and go to different locations and dive and do that for a living. That was kind of like, okay, yeah, let's see if I can find a graduate program that will like, let me do this. And that's where I ended up um, doing lionfish research for my graduate studies. So yeah, that's really cool. And I love the fact that you're a diver, because (laughs) one common misconception is that black people can't swim. But (laughs) here we are. Here we are. (laughs) So all four. that is that is it. That is it. Great. That's really cool. Um, so related to that, wondering if um, you guys had along the way um, people who inspired you either inside of, of school or outside, outside of school who inspired you along your path to, to do academia and to do research. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to, to jump in before I point fingers again. <laughs> go ahead, Peter. All you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is this what we're doing? Is this what we're doing? The Canadian, you go ahead. You go yeah. ahead. Yeah, <laughs> you, you unmuted first, so go ahead, Peter. <laughs> um, I yeah, I guess so. I remember like growing up, like my parents were like really like uh, great, you know, good at supporting us and through our through our education and everything. So that was definitely like the first role models. Like my my dad is an engineer, my mom is a is a school teacher. Um, so they were definitely the first kind of models that we had for that I had for. Um, <laughs> Um, for doing research and, um, and and thriving in academia. And I remember kind of related to, to me, like wanting to go into medicine was like, I knew a lot of doctors who were black as well, people from, uh, my dad was Nigerian. And so we knew a lot of Nigerian doctors in Canada, even in our small, we, I grew up in North Bay for most of my like childhood, which is in Northern Ontario. Um, very, not very diverse. Um, yeah. But there were like, there were Nigerian doctors in that town. So that was something I could see myself doing. I knew, you know, there was a a spot for me there. Um, I didn't see that in biology until I got to even, I think it was grad school when I first started to learn about different, uh, different professors and and researchers who were black in the field. Um, And so it was, but, but now like, you know, especially after there's a lot of big movement towards uh, celebrating and highlighting and you know, showing a lot of these researchers last year. And so now, you know, there's a lot of us in this space. Um, yes! <laughs> and it's dope seeing, uh, you know, seeing everybody and, and seeing how successful everybody is in this field too. Absolutely. Very cool. So, so inspiration slash push from your parents and from, I guess, like a community from when you were, from your, when you were younger is really where it all started. That's very, yeah. very cool. Mm-hmm. And a lot of, and a lot of, uh, a lot of great mentors along the way as well, who were not necessarily black, but who were great allies and, and very supportive along the way too. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, Olivia, now you, now you will go. <laughs> um, so I think growing up, I was, I was very much an athlete, but I was also like very academic oriented. So I just was like in my own world running around and then also just having to be good at school because I'm competitive nature in both sense. So those were like the things that set me up for basically pursuing something. I still don't, I didn't have an idea of who was an example of that for me necessarily in the end, but my mom, uh, she's a single mom. She didn't have any education background because she had me very, very young. So she couldn't pursue 
uh, post-secondary education, she just saw such power in education and wanted that for me. So she said, you got to go for it because this is going to set you up for whatever you want to do. And it's going to just give you the knowledge and the tools to, to be successful. And um, she is, has supported me through that. And I think that's was like, okay, this is something to make her proud. This is something that I think will also be uh, very fulfilling for myself. And that's why I was like, okay, this is why this is, um, this is a good example of what I can do with education, which she wasn't necessarily able to, um, for an exact individual. I don't think I really had anyone at the time that I, um, looked up to or gave me the the guidance I needed. Um, I think I was always one of the only ones in most spaces. And that was mm-hmm. the previous episode, right? Being the only right. one, with, exactly. um, a topic. And, and that definitely was the case. Um, but eventually you just find your footing. Um, and I guess that happened naturally for me. Um, and then, yeah. Wow. That was it. And now here you are, here you are. That's really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And, and I agree. It, it does tie into, um, a little bit of what we talked about in the first episode. So thank you for tying that in, uh, in terms of, of being the only one. I, I do find that that is the case for, for many of us, but um, maybe we'll let Alex get into, into her response before we dig, dig a bit more into that. I'm just going to copy and paste what the other two said, because <laughs> I don't know if you didn't pick up on this before, Peter, but my dad was an engineer and my mom is also a school teacher. No <laughs> what? Stop and this. Olivia, I, most of what I did to get to college was be an athlete. So just repeat what you guys just said. <laughs> um, no, it's, yeah, it's similar stories where I don't have any, like, I, I think I, I think I mentioned this last time through my entire I don't know, 20 years in academia, I have had one African American, one black teacher my entire life, like through, I did an English major before I did science. So English, science, grad school, postdoc, like one, one teacher. So um, it's a lot of like, picking and choosing people who support you for who you are, not by who you look. Um, and similar to you guys, like those people were my parents when I was young, like, my mom homeschooled us up until high school. And basically, because of that upbringing, it's like, you can do whatever you want. Like, it doesn't matter who you are, what you look like. Like, if you want to do it, you can do it. You are smart. Let's go there. Um, And then having an engineer as a dad, it's like science is an option, not just other things that people tell you you fit into. And so, um, but so that was like really nice just to have like that type of self-confidence before I went out into the world and had other people tell me that I was different or something else. And so I was very sure of who I was and I'm still not sure what I want to do, but I am sure of what I'm interested in. And so I have, you know, I have people who support me regardless of what I'm interested in and support me to, to achieve those goals. And so um, I think for getting into science specifically, um, I had a math teacher actually who was like, you're pretty smart. Why don't you sign up for this like undergraduate support program and they will help you do other things. And um, that got me into um, a McNair Scholars Program, which gave me a whole lot of resources that let me try out research and working with different groups. And so that was um, kind of like a chance happening that that helped me build a support network as an undergrad that I still use today. So pretty great. I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's so, so interesting how our stories are, are so similar. I mean, um, I don't have an engineer dad <laughs> or an educator mom, so maybe not the exact same, but it definitely ties into, um, the, like I said before the last episode, in terms of um, who who were, I guess, mentors or role model, models outside of the home. So uh, Olivia in the chat had posted that zero professors who educated were Black um, during her academic career. Same with me. I, throughout my, um, as far as I can remember, throughout uh, elementary school, high school, undergrad and grad school have not had a black uh, professor um, or or research supervisor and that's not to say that um, I didn't have mentors as, as Peter had mentioned you know we have support um, and, and and mentors along the way and for me um, one of those people in my undergrad was my undergrad uh, research supervisor Dr. Paul Bergonia who is a, a white guy and big burly white guy um, at um, Western University in chemistry and you know when I went to him and I said you know is do you think I can do grad school? He's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's not glamorous. Like grad school is not for the faint of heart, but you can do it. And so um, while there aren't at, at, throughout my career, there haven't been people who look like me. The The hope is that there will be more of us and and we do exist. And so it's just a matter of connecting and promoting and, and um, taking support where we can get it. So 
um, yeah, definitely, definitely think that's important. So thank you for sharing that, sharing those, those things with, with me, um, friends, friends just, who are uh, here. I just want to add on as well. Like one of the, you know, to speak specifically to one network, like the Canadian Black Scientist Network is such a, you know, such an incredible resource and, and connection and like hub of, uh, of connecting people together. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, pr I'll promote my network too. The, the, one that, the one that I associate with a lot is the Black Women in Marine Science. And that is like just seeing all these beautiful women who do the same thing as I do. It's yeah. amazing. It's like, I wish I could just propel these Zoom meetings back on my like younger self and say, look, there's hundreds of you out there all around the world. Yeah, so right, right. We're right. getting right. to the point where we have people who look like us to look up to, which is really great. Mm -hmm, exactly. And, and that's getting to the discussion of, of, of why we're here today in terms of representation. So I'll just use this moment uh, to, to just talk a little bit about that and, and, and where that came from. Obviously, as um, as we all know, last summer, huge explosion, huge movements in terms of um, Black Lives, Black Lives Matter. And um, that's trickled into so many aspects of, of our lives, including, you know, um, personally, academia and research. And so um, I don't know if it weren't for that, if we would have connected. I mean, the uh, Canadian Black Scientist Network, um, that is where I found all of you guys. <laughs> so I'm just going to say that. This is a shout out to the Canadian Black Scientist Network. Um, I did not have many uh, Black scientists in my life or, or peers, and, and it's been you know transformative. And so in terms of, of representation, I was watching this YouTube uh lady her name is Khadija Bo and she is a 28 year old lady from Toronto and she talks about representation in the media which is the first thing that we all kind of think about in terms of representation and um, she descri described thanks for sharing the link Ian um, she describes how there's there's two sides of representation and she did a video essay with lots of references which I will not mention because I don't remember um, but there's two sides of representation the first the first side of it is you know there's power representation there's power in seeing yourself in doing something, which I think is, you know, the most, the easiest way for us to understand and, and, and uh, accept why we need to see more of ourselves, whether that be um, as researchers, at, as administrators, deans, wherever, there needs to be more of a reflection of who we are in those various roles. But there's also power in, in who is not there and who's controlling representation. So the fact that, for example, we uh, some of us, I'll just speak specifically to Olivia and myself, have not had Black educators or Black teachers throughout our whole lives. Like, what what does that mean? And who who are the people along the way that contributed to that uh, that void? You know, that 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 lack of of uh, people of color, Black people specifically, in those areas. So so the power of representation in that case is the power of the people who who are controlling who we don't see, right? So Olivia, you're popping yeah. in here. Yeah, I wanted to comment on that because I think what's, I don't know if it, it, being a black woman in science, you start to pull from the other areas you intersect. So, and that can ap apply to so many other um, areas as well, um, where I've been pulling from role models that I see that are women in science and that has really motivated myself, but still leaving, leaving out that other void, but having those at least like keeps me going, keeps me moving mm -hmm. in the right direction. Um, and they, they become a huge ally, of course. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's definitely something that'll come up in discussion today about retainment um, mm -hmm. and ensuring that we're supporting black grads. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for popping in there for, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's as a, as a student, as young people, just trying to figure out what we're trying to do, who we are, where we're going next. It's, it's, it's important to, to pull that support um, from wherever we can get it. And, and like you said, um, other women, uh, women scientists, female scientists who are, are inspirational and contributing to building our self-confidence, building our research niche or whatever that is, that's important. Um, but part of the importance of this discussion is talking about the fact that um, representation needs to change and hopefully is changing. Um, and thank you again to all of you who are in the room, um, uh, attendees who are, I'm hoping, are, are, are looking forward and, and um, looking to help contribute to that change. Um, so, so yeah, so that's the first segment of the discussion, uh, the good of black grad we're going to transition into the bad it's never really bad bad we don't we don't 
cry here. Although I, you can cry if you want at any point, Peter, looking at you. Um, we, but we just talk about challenges that we've experienced and, and we'll speak to challenges um, r- related to representation, retention and recruitment. Um, while we transition into this segment, um, Ian, can we do poll two please now? Uh, is, I wonder if he's here. Hello? Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Great. So um, the question here is, if you had to guess what percentage of your faculty or department is Black, and so um, as each of us has mentioned, there, I have felt, um, and I feel um, my, my peers here have felt that in many instances, they've been the only one, and we're not going to harp on that too much, but just in getting an idea of um, where each of you have come from. Um, by department, are we including students? Yeah, we're including students, staff, we're including everybody just because it's, I realize that this is not like a very um, controlled question, a controlled survey question, and we have a, a number of different uh, attendees here. So just if you had to guess within your your wider sphere of where you're at in, in the institution, um, what would that value be? Um, and we'll we'll move forward from there, but... Yes. Right, uh, 83%. Uh, Eve, did you want me to close it or just wait a bit? Um, we'll give it like maybe like five more seconds yeah. and then we can close it. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. All right. And there we All are. All right. So less than 1%. Yeah. Um, okay. That's not surprising. I mean, unfortunately, it's not surprising. That's what, what I I personally would feel. Um, it's, it's a per, why is that percentage and not numbers? Because it depends on where you're at, what your institution is, the size of the university, blah, 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 blah. But, um, thank you. Thank you everyone for answering. Um, less than 1% is the, um, leading response. And then less than 5% after that five to 10%, um, five to 10% is probably if, if, if you have responded that way, that's, um, likely reflective of the population of, um, black people in either generally in Canada or perhaps within within your um, community, and that's that's great to see. Um, would always love to see more, but I think more often than not, it's it's much less than and than the proportion that we see in our communities, and so that's what we're we're here to talk about. So thanks for thanks for pulling that uh, question up, Ian, and and so um, just related to that, um, do you um, panelists here? Do you remember the first time you? Um, interacted with your your a black colleague and um what was that like um is there any moments that stand out or um basically just trying to think about what that feels like and and how that relates perhaps to to representation i'm going to pick on alex (laughs) (laughs) um yeah i well i'm trying to i think i don't know if i remember the first one I'm sure, trying to sure. think of, like sequentially but I do know that like every time I meet a black person in kind of my field um it's a memorable occasion and I probably can count the number of people on like one or two hands and I'm still in contact with all of those people so right. like even starting back um playing water polo like everybody knows my family is like the black people who swim and you know our community <laughs> it's like oh yeah blah 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 you're those people so like that's like one thing um but what I think one of my favorite memories is I went to a conference in Victoria British Columbia uh 2019 sure. and I walked into this like invasive species panel and I just like zoomed in <laughs> on the back of a girl's head and she had these gorgeous braids and I'm like I instantly got on and texted like my mom my best friend I was like there's another black girl here at this conference <laughs> it's a marine fit like we're doing fisheries and there's another black person <laughs> and um it turned out her last name was also Davis and we we're like Stop. oh my god we're sisters <laughs> in science and we are still just like wonderful friends like we went out and got a drink like yeah. Spent the like the rest of the conference it was just like you know there was like no question like we saw each other we instantly started talking we are still friends like we do stuff together all the time it's just like you know and I've got stories from like a couple you know other conferences where I still have like that one friend who I met at the one conference and we haven't seen each other in three years but still connect online and so it's it's such a fun experience because you, you you go in knowing you're going to be the only one and yeah. that there's not going to be anybody who looks exactly like you or you're going to be like, you know, this has happened where I've been mistaken for the help at a conference because it's at a hotel, you know, things like that. So you zoom in on that person and it's just like there's no 
no like small talk whatever like instantly like we're the only black people here let's be friends and, then <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's amazing so. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks for sharing that I think Peter had might have had a similar uh example um but yeah do you remember uh the first time that you interacted with somebody who was a scientist and was a black lady or a black man like do you remember what that was like and how that made you feel yeah yeah I remember I'm I'm you know I had the same experience and it's crazy walking into conferences about like biological diversity and talking about, you know, the importance and value and, and celebrating diversity. Right. Um, and it's a very homogenous room. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, it's, it can be startling, but, but the excitement like almost makes up for it when you do find other, other black folks at conferences. I remember this wasn't the first time that I, that I saw a black person at a conference, but I remember at a conference in Toronto, um, I was like, it was midway through the conference and I was like, slightly burned out and like looking across this room at the coffee um at the the coffee time or whatever and then this lady like someone came up behind me and and just taps me on the shoulder and I looked behind me and it was uh Dr. Raywin Grant who's this like super cool um researcher of like carnivores she has like a Nat Geo show and she's like just an amazing like inspiring researcher and she's like there's not many of us out here, is there? It's like, oh, <laughs> shit. Was, sorry, I don't know. That's fine. It's um, absolutely fine. But it was, <laughs> it was just awesome. And, like, we, you know, we, we chatted for a while. She, like, you know, exchanged, like, contact. And uh, it was it was really awesome. And there are a lot of experiences like that. A lot of people that, students that, you know, we're still, we're at the same career stage and we still keep in touch and and, and see each other at every conference and, uh, mm-hmm. and at other events and stuff. So it's it's great, I guess, for building that community. You know, you feel you already have like a, a head start in terms of building that relationship and then you know you just stay a lot more connected but it's uh few and far between but yeah. mm-hmm. right the double-edged sword for sure yeah how about you olivia oh man i'm still waiting on one of those moments at a conference it sounds like because oh. every time i've been to a conference it's, it's either i'm like the youngest one there so it just didn't it's like no one wants to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> little child that's trying to get their foot in the door in research at the time. So this was like prior to starting my graduate degree. Um, and then in graduate school, again, I'm, I'm with my team. I'm with like, I have a great set of friends. They may not be black, but they're also mm-hmm. really great allies and supporters. And you go to conferences with them in grad school that you almost get um, drowned out with the other groups there. And um, I've seen a handful. Neuroscience is still one of those fields that are fairly behind with representation and seeing really any Black people in neuroscience. Um, But definitely when I shifted into the EDI lens and world and was like, this is something that I want to really champion was Mm -hmm. when I started to to meet some amazing people I wish I'd met younger, Um, really would have had uh, been great mentors for me at this time, but now we're all working together and kind of doing stuff at the same level, which is mind blowing to me at times too. Um, but one that stood out to me um, is is Dr. Nicole Kanicki. She is mm-hmm. a great EDI advocate here at Western. She just moved over to um, U of T as now the the director of EDI um, in research and innovation. So I'm like, damn, that's what I want to do. But um, <laughs> I'm thinking of all the def- <laughs> many careers that I want to do at this rate. Yeah, um, but just speaking with her and having this like really down to earth conversation about experiences and being in science, because she also had, um, had a kinesiology degree and moving through that and what that looked like and um, how, to, how to really navigate those spaces was a really huge help and really great um, and fruitful discussion and it kept me going. I was like, this is a space that even though I don't feel like I necessarily belong in all the time, I can definitely thrive in mm-hmm. if I know how to use the resources and tools in that space. And you have to be fairly strategic mm-hmm. with it as well. But I think that's that really stood out to me. Um, cool. And then, of course, the students along the way that are now like pushing the EDI work and holding institutions accountable. Those are the yes. ones that, that keep, me, keep the blood flowing. <laughs> yeah. and keep, yeah. those, those are always my um, go to's. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like uh, it's such an, a unique experience, like being almost always be like being the only one and then, you know, seeing somebody across the room or being at a conference or, or being in, in like a town hall, for example, and, and having others who look like you and, and, and feeling that sense of community. Um, but for, for everybody else who who's in this room, attendees, um, it might be a question for them. Um, we're all scientists and um, we focus on, you know, principles, which are from 
natural laws and they, they, they dictate how we look at our, look at our work and how we question our, our work and things like that. And so um, if science is, is so kind of cut and dry and black and white, why do, why does, why does diversity matter? I mean, why does having more black people matter if we're teaching somebody about, I don't know, the ideal gas law or about cell replication, you know, like I, I know that we're all scientists in this room and, and often these discussions happen with um, sociologists and or um, people doing history in black studies because uh, the history of black people in Canada is part of the history of Canada. And that's of, of course part of the discussion. But if we're thinking about other spaces, whether that's math, science or English, like why does that, why does it matter? So um, that's a question that I'll, I'll pitch to you guys uh, here now. And I will see who raises their hand. Yes, Alex. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say, um, I don't know specifically about teaching ideal gas law. because <laughs> That's fine. I'm a chemist. That's, that's just what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just thinking about the importance of um, diverse perspectives in my field of work. So conservation science and invasive species management. I'm thinking about what folks value. Um, everybody in this room values something different when it comes to the ocean or a coastal ecosystem. And um, by getting diverse scientists, you just inherently tend to ask more a, a diverser, a more diverse set of questions. And then you start to explore a more diverse set of answers. And so mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, again, this isn't inherently like specific to black people, but it's just if you the more diversity you have in the ways of thinking, the the higher chance you have of coming up with a attainable solution that works for a larger majority of people. And especially when you have limited resources, limited time, limited personnel, limited money, coming up with a solution that works for everybody is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And even more so if you just have one train of thought coming from one kind of like homogenous group of people, like Peter said, it's if everybody's taught the same way, thinks the same way, you're never going to reach a solution that works for this huge group of people like my, you know, the people I'm working with span from California to Alaska, right. nobody's going to have the same opinion. And so it's just really important to address that and, and be very candid about it. It's like, you are different than me, you live in a different place, you look different, you value different things. And I want to know how to integrate that into my plan, because otherwise, it's not going to work. So awesome. Very good. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. So well said. Oh my so goodness. well said. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was brilliant. And I just wanted to, to feed off of that, because I think when you, when you add that perspective at the researcher level, when you start then thinking about how we communicate and integrate and recruit and discuss from different populations, that in itself will now consider um, different um, barriers that might be in the way for those groups to either be involved in the research or even have their opinion or voices heard in that research. And that's so important for also improving the quality of science, right? And from a sci scientist perspective, um, so, for example, a lot of the research in, in the cardiology sphere completely ignored women and then women were having different <sighs> symptoms and side effects with heart attacks and that and the medications were not um, they suitable. Right. <laughs> they weren't correct. Yeah. And that that is just one example. And I think we've done really well at including more women in science. And now it's going that extra step. Right. Absolutely. It's now it's not perfect. We still we still have a lot of work to do there. But now it's ensuring that we have all of the right groups involved because that dictates one, the quality of science and how people are living and the quality of life on a daily basis and how how enriching that is and how impactful that is. And even at a ecosystems level too, same thing applies. Perfect, yeah, I agree. Anything to add there, Peter? Yeah, I, well, I just wanna second everything that, uh, that Alex and Olivia just said, it was brilliant. Um, I guess the only thing I'll add is that like, I find it so strange sometimes how as scientists we always ask like, or not we, but like how scientists often ask like, you know, oh, it's like the value of diversity or like, how do we know there's a problem? And it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> They're not a problem. Like, <laughs> sure. the no, like it's, it's, it seems so clear that like when you look at an undergrad, you know, population of students, like you have not a huge amount of, of black people, but you have a pretty diverse population. And then as you look at graduate students, it's much smaller. As you look at faculty, it's like non-existent. Um, and it's like, you know, it's crazy to me how some people can look around a room and see that at a professor level and then go teach their class. And think that there isn't some sort of problem like mm -hmm. you know just there's no reason to expect that that would happen right so right. there's clearly some sort of selective pressure um mm -hmm. and even in the absence of all of the 
you know, huge body of literature we have of how diversity improves science. It's like, there's clearly a problem going on that, that should, that we should take a closer look at. Um, awesome. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys for, for your responses are very articulate people, obviously just going to big you up mid mid uh, episode. Um, so we'll switch over to recruitment just a little bit before we head into the, the next, um, the next segment. Um, so, uh, the question I initially had pitched was, um, was there, what made you choose the institutions that you worked at? But maybe the question should be more so about what, what do you think, um, would have been helpful for, for you um, when you were applying to schools um, to, to make you want to go to those schools, like from, you know, not just generally as a student or as a scientist, but specifically to you as a, a Black person, do you think that in terms of recruitment, there are things that um, would have pulled you to institutions or what do you think should be done in terms of recruitment right now for students coming in? Um, kind of a big question here, but that's why we're here. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's a really loaded question because honestly, I haven't seen it done right. So mm. I don't really yeah. know. Like, I can provide sure. some suggestions, maybe. Um, so where? So I grew up in Mississauga, Ontario, very diverse community, which was um, really great to be around. Again, I still think at the secondary school level, there's a lot of filtering that's happening and putting a lot of Black students into the college sphere and out of the university mm. area, and that already is a huge, huge line. Um, again sports often is a big part of our, our lives. And that was the part for me. And I was, I, I, and honestly, it added a benefit because it gave me another area of recruitment, other area of pursuing institutions. But right. I hadn't, I had no clue besides the ones that I, I heard of, because I didn't really have anyone who had some sort of post-secondary education to tell me, oh, these institutions will support you in these ways. And probably mm -hmm. if I had a family member who did that, they probably wouldn't have had an answer on the actual experience, more just on the education itself, because mm -hmm. again, being the only one. Um, so for me, what helped me navigate which institution was scholarship, really. Um, financial aid and the financial barriers is a huge thing. So I was like, okay, what school will give me the most money? I do a lot. And I think um, that, that leadership potential I had when I was young was something that I wanted to really feed off of in case academics wasn't the strongest. Luckily, I was okay with that area too, but at least I, I was well-rounded. And I think mm -hmm. that was what's appreciated in a lot of scholarships nowadays, especially. Um, and that is something that I, I champion, even as an athlete, even in the academic sphere, sphere, you need to be able to have this well-rounded angle and scholarship was like okay I'm going to Western scholarship Kate okay, that'll keep me there yeah. I didn't even really know Western would be a big option and then after that again more scholarship kept me and I'm very fortunate to to be where I am today so thanks Olivia thank you what about the other two any ideas about recruitment so um just as you're answering uh Olivia this point about scholarships has come come up actually in the last episode as well in terms of um give, give people money, <laughs> give people money that helps, you know, especially from, you know, people who are, um, financially disadvantaged, uh, areas, money helps. And so, um, not only creating these scholarships, but I think, uh, part of it is maybe directly, um, going to different cities, different communities, going to the black communities and, and letting, letting these people know that, Hey, our schools are available to you. Like, we want you to be there. What what does it take? And oftentimes, a, the money is just the the first step in opening that door. But I do think it's an important important step. So yeah, I just wanted to add. Sorry, I don't want to take away. But scholarships in themselves are very can be racist, systemically racist. So the ones that I benefited from were the ones that didn't just look at the classic academics, etc. It had to be the extra because mm -hmm. already there were so many barriers just to be considered for some of those. It wasn't until I had to show that I did all these other things that makes me more eligible than the other student who probably had all the resources necessary right. to be successful as possible. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Olivia. Any other additional points here, Peter, Alex, before we move on? Nope, we're good. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> this is the worst. This is going to keep happening to the end of the episode. <laughs> Alex, you can go ahead. Okay. I'll assert my American self. And Do talk it. Over everybody. <laughs> 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 so just thinking, kind of building off what Olivia said. So I went to school for sports. Like I 
did, I was offered some academic scholarships to stay. So I grew up in New Mexico and I could have gone to the local university there on academic scholarship, but I wanted to play water polo. So I went to California, got some money to play water polo, got recruited to play water polo at a four year school. And so that's really what drove me to do, um, to choose where I chose. But um, it was also, again, just like these, the people I met along the way, the supportive people. Um, so I, do, I still don't know if I would have gone to whatever schools I did had I not known people there already. So um, I got recruited with two other water polo players. We all wanted to go to this place I'd never been before, Monterey Bay. Now it's my favorite place in the world. I love it, you know, but um, a lot of what drives me to do what I do is the people. Um, same for graduate school. I got to do an internship with the lab I ended up working with and the graduate students are still some of my best friends these today. And I chose to go there so that I could do my field work with them and work with them on a daily basis. And so um, I don't know if I would have chosen Oregon outside of having those people, because as I found out being a black person in Oregon, um, Oregon is not a very black friendly state, mm -hmm. um, even more so than a lot of other states in the, in the U S which is really interesting. Um, so that was a difficulty I had to deal with once I moved there. And had mm -hmm. I not had that support network, I don't know if that is something I would have um, chosen sure. to deal with on my own. Yeah. So, cause it, it would have, it would have meant doing a lot of putting myself out there and finding those other people without having some of my allies there with me. So, which is a hard um, thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <for laughs> Especially sure. in a giant school where, um, you just walking on campus, you don't see anybody who looks like you and except for like in random situations. So, right. Yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. that, Alex. <laughs> Thank you for that, Peter. Anything before we move on to the next uh, segment? Um, I'll I'll just echo like both of what they said. I think, and especially what Alex was saying about you know kind of the people and taking taking the time, and uh, that was something that I know is really important for me. Like looking at undergrad universities, um, my parents uh, took me to a few different universities that I had applied to, and you know I kind of emailed some professors and. You know, in hindsight, is like sometimes that even now as a PhD student, I I don't get answers back from professors when I email them. And so the fact that some professors, you know, took the time back to email like a high school student and then took the time to sit down and, and show me their lab and, and talk about the program, um, it really it really made a great impression. It's not something that's, you know, it's something that that helps not black not just black folk or minorities, but helps everybody. It's um, it's one of these kind of just just general things, but it really does make a difference for for recruiting um, people to the to programs, especially when they, you know, don't necessarily see themselves on campus or, you know, don't, um, yeah, Absolutely. especially when there are additional challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, there's, it sounds like this, the, the theme here is uh, people and, and being open. And so, um, it's not just not just the scholarship beyond the scholarship and getting somebody through the door. It's, you know, um, allowing uh, students and people of color to come come to your lab to come onto campus to see that it is an option for them and to see themselves as potentially being being um being able to envision themselves on in that place i think that's very important and also just knowing that um there's a supportive group of people who will be there once they get there is also i think a huge a huge aspect of of uh of recruitment and so thank you for that um you yeah, already I, was gonna say, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but that's, I think, one of the major components of retention of Black people on campuses as well. It's like, like the, that, just like you said, the sense of belonging and wanting and feeling like you're, you're welcome there. That mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Now that's a hundred percent leading into the next section here and we're running a little bit behind, but I think that that's okay because it means the discussion is going well. So I see Dr. Hewitt, Dr. Kevin Hewitt, who will, who will be with us in just a few moments. Um, he's waiting uh, in, in the stand. So I'll just let him know we're just a little bit behind, but we will get to you very soon. Dr. Hewitt, thank you for being here. And so um, we're going to just pull up Poll question number three, which is talking to people who are in academia uh, about how, how they're feeling about it and if they think they'll stay. And that is because um, the next question, which I will pitch to my panelists, is um, why do we think Black people leave academia? Um, and, and so I guess that's from the perspective of someone who's already been in undergrad, maybe has gone to grad school, and then what happens next? So um, that's the as we get to talking about the future, um, I think for the next five-ish minutes here, five, 10 minutes here, um, 
I think that's a first, a good place to start. So for those who are in uh, academia or in research or whatever, um, do you think you'll stay and uh, let us know why or why not from our answers? What are What is our percentage here of response, Ian? We're at uh, 68% right now. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds here. And uh, I can't believe an hour has flown by. This is always, this always happens. Like, I'm like, I have this whole other segment to do, two segments. We're going to get it done. It's fine. We'll be a little bit behind, but it's okay. All right, so let's see a response here. So most people here are not in academia, but that's okay. That is fine. Um, the, the next uh, answer is, um, if they'll stay, maybe if considered other options. And then it's quite mixed between yes, probably, probably not. And then a few people say no. So it's all over the place, all over the place. Um, so thank you for responding there. But um, getting back to our question for our panelists here, um, maybe just pick on one, one or two of you to save time. But why do we think that Black people will leave academia? Um, Alex, maybe we'll start with you because in terms of uh, this question, what you had just said just feeds in nicely to, I think, this answer. Yeah, and I think we we all kind of touched on this when we had our pre-meeting. It's just um, the feeling of not belonging. You know, it's hard, you know, and this ties into the, the um, panel discussion last month. It's, it's hard being the only one. It's hard going months and weeks and days without seeing anybody who looks like you. And anytime something happens that involves someone who looks like you, people look to you for answers or start tokenizing you and assuming that you have the same experience as that person. Um, so it's emotionally taxing often to be the only um, person of color, the only black person in a department or a group or cohort just because of how you are perceived by everybody else. You are not just another scientist in the department. You're the black scientist in the department. You are the one. Um, and that just, it gets old. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, I think one of the questions you have on here, are like cohort hires, um, I think it's a great idea. Like one of the reasons why I mentally was able to finish graduate school is because um, me and some other folks formed this, you know, we started calling them brown people lunches. We mm -hmm. got together once a month. We were the three or four non-white people in our department. And we just sat and talked about what it was like being the only ones. And then we started finding more people and more people and building a community. So we built that community ourselves instead of having the, the university okay. provide it for us. Right. And that, saved a lot of us, I think. And so mm -hmm. not having the ability to reach out and find those people and build that community makes it hard. So if universities can hire cohorts together, it gives you that bit of stability that oftentimes you have to forge on your own, or if you don't, you just feel isolated. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Cole hires was, was a part of the, the next discussion in terms of talking about the future. Um, I don't know if uh, Peter or Olivia have opinions about cohort hires or if they see on, on your campuses at Western or, or at uh, Ottawa, do you see that happening or um, any other suggestions in terms of um, recruitment and retention of Black people on campuses? Um, I think it's a, a few things. So when I'm thinking about um, staying in academia, I think when being Black is one thing, but then on top of that, you have all those other considerations that everyone else is right. now thinking in academia, which is very common. Can I handle this stress? Can I apply for grants? Can I keep that hustle for the rest of my life, essentially? Mm -hmm. Can I build and be a business woman, in my case, at the same time of establishing a lab and being in an academic space and then navigating those spaces and then you're adding the block on top of that. So yeah. I think that's just a lot. It and is. without much representation and much mentorship in that, that makes it extremely hard. And I think what Alex highlighted was the cohort hires or cohort um, uh, recruitment, which allows you to kind of have just the natural, oh, we're on the same starting point. Let's work on that together. And then hopefully you find those that you identify with even more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where things get a little uh, muddled. And, and there could be other career paths that are more appreciative of your lived experiences without being tokenized with it just naturally fitting that role and you being just excelling at it. Right. So why stay in academia? You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. Um, and, and building lives and having families along with all of that. Mm -hmm. So there's so much there. Um, yeah. and, and in terms of what other programs are doing, so I, I was involved in setting up a program Again, scholarship always helps to keep people retained and, and want to attend and then building the programs 
So scholarship is one thing, but then what are you doing for those students to uh, make sure that they feel supported? Mm -hmm. Because with scholarship, so comes a lot of academic stress because you feel like you've been successful then. Imposter syndrome kicks in. Why am I here? Should I be here? Um, And then you don't have anything to support yourself in that experience. So I think, um, for example, I worked on a project that uh, recruited those from underrepresented groups into neuroscience with BrainScan, which is a huge initiative here at Western. And what that did was bring in really diverse group of students who are now going through that cohort together. That's so nice. Um, one thing. Yeah. And then in that, there's going to be tools to help them prepare for academia, which many may not have experienced at all. So mm-hmm. how to get a paper and report together? How do you look at publishing? How do you get to conferences? What do those costs and expenses look like, et cetera? So I think- Sounds those- extremely useful. Yeah. <laughs> it and then sounds like I, I could have used that. Those- yeah. How to have those skills. And then of course, tied in with the mentor um, in that group which is really important. And then, yeah, there's so much. Mm-hmm. That was just a thought. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Peter, any, any thoughts before I fire off this next question and then bring on Dr. Hewitt. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I guess I just want to point out one thing for everyone watching as well, which is that sometimes, you know, the, like how big these things are, how big, like, you know, the, the, the push is out of academia, whether you want to, whether you're doing grad school and you want to stay in academia or not, like, you feel a lot of these things, the sense of, of being alone, the sense of, you know, being the only one in the room. Um, and it might not, like, at panels like this, it might not always come across as a big thing, but it's important to understand that, like, all four of us here are, like, people who are still thriving in grad school, right? Who are still thriving as researchers in academia. Mm-hmm. And nonetheless, we're still experiencing, like, a huge amount of, uh, of pressure and, and challenge from these feelings. And so, like, you know, just picture the people who aren't in this panel here. right now, right? The people who Absolutely. aren't here, who, who didn't make it so far. Every stage, I'm sure everyone else here has the same, you know, experience of like every stage from every year of undergrad to every year of grad school, there are less and less, if there were any starting out of, of Black folks or people of color around you, they just become less and less as you go on. Um, and so just to keep that in mind, of people watching that, like, this is the people who are thriving who are saying this. So just imagine the people who are, you know, who are, who are struggling. Not at, yeah, who are, who mm-hmm. are struggling or who are, mm-hmm. who are starting out and having a more challenging time. Either. That's a really good point. Thank you for pointing that out because you're right. Like if uh, there are people who are not in the room who are, we are representing and, and speaking on behalf of, and, and um, I know personally have had people reach out to me who are, who are struggling in grad school and not necessarily because of the research that they're doing, but because of their identity. And so um, I, I, I really do appreciate you bringing up that point because yeah, it it does speak to how hard it is to even get to this stage to have this conversation. So yeah, very valid. So um, I'm going to break here. I'm going to give all our panelists currently a break so that we can switch over to bring on the reputable Dr. Kevin Hewitt. So um, anybody who watched the first episode, um, I had done a poll to ask if they would be interested in um, a new segment called Petition the professor. I really like alliteration, so maybe not the best, <laughs> the best uh, name, but basically having a black faculty member here to to speak on the topics that that we're we're we're, are, we're, we're discussing today. So I'll just give a brief bio here. Um, Dr. Hewitt is a full professor in the Department of Physics and Atmospheric Science and Chair of S- and Senate at Dalhousie University. In his molecular imaging lab, he's developed no- no- novel nanoparticle probes for cancer imaging and treatment, and new optical and imaging approaches and a prototype medical diagnostic tool. Um, He has unified his interest in science and community engagement um, by co-founding the Imhotep Legacy Academy, an award-winning STEM outreach program for African Nova Scotian students from high schools, uh, from junior high, excuse me, to university. And these passions have led to several appointments to both national and international bodies, including most recently, the National uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Council of Canada, Discovery Research Institute's Support Fund Grant Selection Committee. And Dr. Hewitt has spoken at many presentations, over 60 in fact, um, at both national and international audiences, and has even featured in a movie, uh, the Cool Black North, which is a film that explores um, the unique and vibrant Canadian Black community and its role in our country's identity. So Dr. Hewitt is a father. He has uh, children, two of which are younger, which he's co-parenting now, and uh, to a daughter who's 14 um, in Ontario, or in BC, excuse me, and one who's 28 who's in um, BC. And he is here with us today. So thank you for uh, letting me ramble off your, your bio there. And welcome, Dr. Hewitt. 
Thanks for having me, Evelyn. I really thoroughly enjoyed the discussion earlier. I think the future is bright. Uh, you know, uh, and thanks uh, to Peter for bringing up the Canadian Black Scientist Network. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just a pleasure to be here and um, absolutely contribute what I can. To yeah, the- absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I just to start off, I guess, I'm just wondering if you had any any thoughts, um, any continuing thoughts from the discussion we've had that these um, lovely professionals here have have shared with us. Um, anything you want to add? Sure. Um, a lot of points uh, of um, that I could take off on, but you know, being a uh, in a family with a single mother that emphasizes education as the key. Uh, that's been a part of my history, so I appreciated Olivia's um, uh, point on that. This, the importance of sports <laughs> in um, I'm. You know, I, I didn't go to a four-year college to do basketball, but uh, <laughs> I do feel that it's, uh, it's very important in helping you persevere um, th- through this system that, you know, uh, is at times pretty, pretty degrading. Um, uh, and the continuing emphasis on um, the need to reduce a sense of isolation, right, where pretty small fraction of um, the Canadian population and then an even smaller fraction uh, within our respective fields. Uh, So physicists, for example, uh, we just conducted the first uh, survey of the physics community, diversity survey of the physics community in Canada. And uh, we couldn't report the exact number because you guessed it, it's too small. Um, So there are, um, uh, there are actually two black faculty at Dalhousie in physics um, and um, about three others uh, across the country. Uh, So, so any program that tries to reduce that sense of isolation, the network is one example uh, I can recall um, when I felt that sense of isolation I actually turned to the U.S. Alexandra Ooh. to um, find a, a group of physicists um, as part of the American Physical Society Committee on Minorities in Physics, and that's where I found my network, found my support. It's only two decades uh, following that. Um, that I was able to, you know, bring together the Black and Canadian physics uh, group. Again, a handful, but, um, you know, we started, we've started a conversation. Um, and to the, to the uh, mention of the financial barriers, uh, you know, at Dalhousie, we've um, we've now established a set of scholarships. I'm not advertising Dalhousie, by the way. It's okay. <laughs> Everybody can promote themselves here. This is an open space to big up yourself. Don't worry about it. I am fine with it. <laughs> um, yeah, we we undertook an examination of our uh, institution's relationship with slavery and racism. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lord Dalhousie panel and the resulting report and. I created a set of scholarships, the Sankofa scholarships, um, to uh, for supporting uh, international students from the Caribbean, Caribbean students, um, uh, domestic Caribbean students, and African Nova Scotian students. Uh, and the other thing that I think uh, some of you may be aware of is. Um, if you look, well, certainly if you look at the stats for physicists that was, we just um, produced, the, the real uh, drop in representation seems to occur going from that postdoc to uh, faculty or other level, right? And of course, uh, you're in that stage right now. Um, and when I look at the compendium of programs across the country, 
that's a, a really big gap. Um, so, so trying to profile uh, scientists, um, black scientists, um, in that way is a goal of ours. And um, so we've used the Canadian Black Scientist Network list to identify some folks who uh, will be presenting at Dalhousie. Uh, not to say there's a, a job waiting you uh, right now, but just to say, hey, the next time this particular faculty uh, or unit um, is um, advertising, they now already know of a, a black faculty member. And this could be from, you know, uh, the assistant professor level. We're also inviting a more senior faculty uh, to target them possibly for Canada Research Chairs uh, mm -hmm. and others. So that kind of uh, approach, I think, um, is uh, one means of trying to address that gap. The question that always comes up in those committee discussions, well, we, we advertised and uh, right. there are none of them out there and blah, right. blah, blah. So, um, so we, in addition to that, we need to have, you know, some more um, programs um, that target that transition. Uh, we know that the barriers are the fact that come about because of the fact that you now have these hiring committees um, and the literature is replete with the bias mm -hmm. uh, that is present. Um, my uh, approach is that uh, one needs, as was mentioned earlier, those cohort hires, but targeted. Mm -hmm. uh, we need targeted uh, approaches, mm -hmm. yeah. especially, and that would be especially important in, uh, in STEM fields, right? Um, so, so that's, those are the things I, uh, I you wrote down. <laughs> down there's more but um i'll leave it there for for oh, no. um, thank you thank you dr hewitt yeah you've spoken to a, a number of of important points and hopefully um for administrators and and senior faculty in the room just ideas of how um certain institutions specifically will speak about dalhousie are thinking about different ways to um Expose the university to potential uh, future researchers. So the the example you gave, Dr. Hewitt, makes sense. You know, just having a speaker series or whatever, whatever it may be, a seminar where um, uh, researchers of color, you know, uh, postdocs or whatever stage it is, are coming in to speak to show, like, hey, like we do exist and we do specific research is a great place to start. And the second point I want to to just reemphasize here is the the targeted. A uh, conscious approach, so not just necessarily putting a call out for um, whatever vacant position there is, but to um, to do the work and with with groups like the Canadian Black Scientist Network or um, VWEMS, uh, which Alex sits on, different community groups which do have um, you know many many Black students and researchers already within that network, going to them and being like, hey, we know that this is a problem, bias is a problem things like this are a problem, like, can you help us out, put this out to the community? So I really like those those points that you raised there, Dr. Hewitt. So thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if uh, any of the panelists have a question for Dr. Hewitt um, before we we open it up um, again here. Okay, nobody does. That's fine. Um, I just want to speak briefly um, or ask Dr. Hewitt before we go back into to, uh, either question and answer or, or final questions for our panelists here. There was a couple um, items that you had shared with me when I met with you briefly um, the other day. So there was two things, the uh, National Dialogues Charter and the Black North, North Initiative. I don't know if you want to speak about those um, quickly here. Sure. Uh, so the Black North Initiative uh, is, uh, again, a national um, initiative uh, trying to link uh, you know, post-secondary 
uh, in there are several committees, but one of the committees that I'm a member of is the Education Committee. So we've identified a number of uh, initiatives um, and we'll try to basically link those with the uh, various corporations now numbering approximately 450 oh. who've pledged, um, who signed the uh, Black North Initiative pledge. Um, uh, second, the second uh, announcement is in relation to um, uh, an upcoming uh, um, summit series. Uh, so mm -hmm. this will be held on June 22nd, uh, a summit Hi. series highlighting um, the issues of um, access, retention, success uh, for Black uh, students, faculty, and staff. Uh, and this is will be leading to um, a national uh, Black Summit in Halifax in 2022. Uh, the other <laughs> activity <laughs> that's going on, uh, I think I've got to step down from something. Uh, You're is, very busy. Uh, You're very busy. <laughs> is the um, you know the outcome of that national dialogues. Um, gathering hosted by UTSC, University of Toronto Scarborough, which is actually my alma mater. Oh, um, cool. and, um, and so, you know, they've, they've basically almost finalizing the charter uh, and um, look out for that um, coming out very soon. Uh, so there's lots, you know, lots of actions uh, coming out of this year uh, of COVID um, and George Floyd. Um, and so it's really accelerated, accelerating the formation of these national organizations. I, I remember, you know, two decades ago, <laughs> it would be unimaginable <laughs> that yeah. we would be at this place today. So... I just want to share that, you know, um, as, uh, you know, sort of a historic perspective. Um, uh, you know, in fact, I remember writing to the, um, to NSERC about the University Faculty Award Program two decades ago, um, and now having a conversation with those tri-council leaders today. So a lot. Wow. Um, is changing and we're not there yet, obviously, but the fact that we're organizing ourselves, um, I think will allow us to have that national voice that's required to make any change. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Hewitt, just dropping wisdom on all of us, giving us this historical perspective of how long it actually takes to, to get to a moment like this. And we always emphasize like it, it's, it is um, hopefully not a mo moment and it is a movement and I'll keep saying so. And so um, we here in this room, not just the panelists, but attendees are, are all responsible for keeping that pressure on and keeping the conversation going to a point where hopefully this isn't, uh, isn't uh, as a uh, point of a conversation and we're, we're getting, we're getting places and, and making actual movement. So thank you, Dr. Hewitt, again, for, for being here with us. And, um, the last question I'll pitch to, to all of you, um, before we open it up to the, uh, uh audience is, um, resources, resources for um, current students, for, for, for faculty, for staff, really just um, anything that we think is helpful to, uh, for this conversation in terms of uh, recruitment, retention, even things like bias. Um, do you guys have any pointers uh, for anybody else here in the room? Um, yeah. Nobody has any pointers. <laughs> well, I'll echo kind of what I said in the, um, the q and A. I I answered um, via typing, but um, a lot of, I think a lot of the resources we talked about and all of us have experiences are built by us. We are doing the work to build the resources that we need. Um, and somebody asked the question of what can um, universities and, and faculties do to support these students? And it's put money into supporting them. Um, because until someone is being paid or someone's being funded to do this work, we are going to have to continue to do it for ourselves. And so 
it, whatever position of privilege you are in, you need to advocate for money to be put into these spaces, this recruitment, this, these retention initiatives, because that shows that not only are like, you think we belong, but you're willing to put money into making us feel like we belong. And so that's kind of always my like, like ultimatum. If you think you care about this and you want to show that you care about this, you put money into it and you put effort into it so that we no longer have to struggle to create these spaces and create these resources and all of these wonderful things by ourselves. And so like, this is a great example. We have support from institutions to put together these wonderful panels and this is amazing. So more stuff like this, more money and just tangible support instead of just saying yes we care about POCs yes we care about diversity yes we care about recruitment you have to put money into it so that's like my, that's my number one thing <laughs> I love it I love yeah. it I that. to add to that I think the second one that is probably equal values if you're going to put money into it towards it you have to actually value that work so meaning yeah. you're going to you're creating these opportunities, but these opportunities are now being put on the load of POC or black graduates to make it possible to improve these experiences, to improve the EDI in your institutions. But then when they go on to, for example, finding those faculty and academic positions, that work that was done isn't valued. There's mm -hmm. no, it's not yes. on a metric to the level of publications. It's not on the metric to the level of, of, um, of, getting grant money, but you put all this time that should have been reserved for research into bettering the experience to bring in more, to open these doors. And it's not like, I, I always want to show the value of all the work that the black community puts in doesn't just necessarily benefit the black community, but it benefits so much of, of POC in general. And it's yeah. really just a huge, huge effort. And the fact that that isn't valued, but can be supported um, really put the wall and there's a stop to it eventually. And that might answer the question why we don't see many black um, graduates continuing in academia. It's because it's not valued. So yeah. yeah, no, thank you for that. Exactly. Recognizing, recognizing work outside of the lab or outside of, of uh, research. Dr. Hewitt. Just picking up on that. I spent two years of my graduate degree with doing community work mm -hmm. um, because it, and it was turned out to be the most rewarding <laughs> aspect of that uh, time frame, And, and just to some uh, action oriented points, the Boyer's uh, model of scholarship, which is, um, which would incorporate that community building uh, into tenure and promotion decisions. That's something that, yep. uh, was just uh, approved by our faculty. Oh, look at that. Association and the university. I love that. Um, a few years ago. So it, putting it into practice is a different story, but, you know, at least it's there <laughs> in the collective uh, agreement. It's a, it's a start for sure. That's that's wonderful. Thank you. I don't know if Peter had one, one more thing to say. Yeah, I was just going to add in. I, I dropped a list of... Uh, uh, a document that has a whole bunch of resources, which are, I think, more US centric and more kind of ecology and nature centric as well, or, or that kind of field. Um, but uh, some resources nonetheless for equity, diversity, and inclusion related stuff. And I think just to add on to the points that were being made earlier about supporting and like, you know, communities or, um, or, or groups within institutions, I think one of the other really important things beyond just funding beyond just giving people the space is like making sure that it's a sustainable structure and often that oh means God, yeah. having a professor or some permanent you know person that's not in charge of running the group but just in charge of like holding it together um right. like it's students turn over so quickly you know we have such grad students are not you know don't have a huge amount of free time and you know maintaining these groups takes a lot of effort so making sure that you're making sure these institutions are permanent these communities are permanent within your institution is super, super key, I think. I agree. I agree. Yeah, that's that's fair. That actually will um, be one of the things we talk about at the next episode. <laughs> I'm so good at segues. One of the things that we talk about the next episode in terms of, uh, you know, sustainability and mental health and the burden of this work. I mean, we do it for the Black community, but we do it for the community at large, like, mm -hmm. like we've all said here. 
Yeah. It's like a continuous circle. It's like, if you value it, you will put money into it. If you put money into it, it will become permanent. And then we'll show that it's like, you can't have any of those three without the others. And it's, yeah. So exactly, yeah, it has to be Mm -hmm. built into the structure. So, so hopefully um, that'll be an interesting discussion for the next episode. We have two and a half minutes left because I'm very good at time management. I'm wondering if anybody here um, in the audience wants to ask a question um, with that remaining time. Um, I did not see anything in the question and answer section. I think that some people typed questions which might've been answered. So thank you um, for answering those questions. Um, We'll give it about 30 seconds here before I start asking everybody to plug themselves or whatever they're doing. Um, nobody is popping up. So, um, yeah. Is there anything that you guys want to promote in these last few moments here, um, about the work that you're doing or, um, initiatives or anything like that? No. Yes. Dr. Of course, Dr. Hewitt. I, I, of course you do, Dr. Hewitt. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. (laughs) I'm sorry. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. Please. So, The set of initiatives that, um, you know, we've been compiling through the Black North Initiative um, that's positively impacting Black student access retention. Um, Among them is one um, at the Ali Motep's Legacy Academy STEM outreach program. We have been changing the face of engineering uh, and STEM at, at Dalhousie. Um, but in addition to that pathway program, there are several others here at Dal um, uh, for other areas. We have a transition year program, which U of T also has. Um, but I, I'll give you a stat to, to show how important these were. Uh, so there's a indigenous back in Mi'kmaq law program before that was established some 30 years ago, there had been no uh, indigenous black um, and Mi'kmaq graduates from the law school. Since that program came into existence, there have been 80. Wow, yeah, there you go. So pathway programs, um, you know, really make a difference. Uh, and so the, you know, funding these with my partner and with corporate partners, I think, uh, will will help with that uh, pathway. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I guess I'll just add a, a, another plug again for the Canadian Black Scientists Network because that's just yes. such an incredible resource. And I know there's a mentorship program coming soon as well, which I'm super excited uh, for, and, and I'm sure a lot of people others are as well. Um, another thing I'll I'll plug and and add is another action item for for faculty or administrators or even students who might not feel like they can make much action at their institution. If you're part of professional societies, that's another avenue to help, um, Mm -hmm. to to do things to help uh, at the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution. Um, I helped start this, uh, we'll call it a spotlight grant, um, which pays uh, black, indigenous, other people of color who are doing research in in ecology and evolution in the community, um, pays them to create videos that spotlight themselves and their research. and then these can be used in classrooms and uh, at you know K to 12 and, and lectures as well at universities. And just one way of, of showcasing some of the diversity of highlighting the researchers and celebrating their accomplishments too, um, which is another, you know, doesn't take a huge amount to, of, of effort to set up, to maintain. Um, it does take some, but um, is, is one thing you can do at professional societies to help as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Peter. Thank you for that. And thank you for all of you guys for being here. There there goes another episode. Yay. Thank you guys so much. (laughs) Dr. Hewitt. Dr. Hewitt. One more thing. Uh, (laughs) Just quickly, uh, the CBSN, Canadian Black Sciences Network, is organizing a B-STEM conference, Black Excellence in STEM Medicine Health. Uh, Look out for that. We're you know, uh, gathering sponsors right now, but that'll be in uh, about November. Okay, uh, sure. So. Coming up this fall, the Cleaning Black Scientist Network Conference. Um, so hopefully you'll hear more about that. Um, so uh, 
Alex asked, are we saving the chat? I think that we will be saving the chat. Um, Ian has access to that. Um, but otherwise, the last thing I'll say is please join us for our next episode, which will be about Black mental health. Um, it'll be on May 20, 28th, I believe it's a Wednesday, from probably around the same time. So that's 10, 10 a.m. Uh, Mountain Center time or 12 p.m. Eastern. And I hope you will join us then. Thank you again to Olivia, Peter, Alex, and Dr. Hewitt for mm-hmm. all of your all of your insightful comments and, and being so open and honest. I really, really could not have done this without you. Um, and I guess we'll just say thank you and goodbye to all of our all of our people here in the room. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so so much. Um, Great job, Evelyn. Thank you, Dr. Hewitt. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.